and welcome to the Management of Obstructive Sleep Apnea in Primary Care webinar hosted by BioSerenity. BioSerenity's mission is to connect patients to their healthcare network for screening, diagnosis, and health management to provide the care they deserve anytime, anywhere. It is my honor and privilege to introduce you to our speaker today, Dr. Michael Coppola. Dr. Coppola completed his medical school, residency, and fellowship at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. He is board certified in internal, pulmonary, and sleep medicine by the American Board of Internal Medicine. Dr. Coppola also serves as medical director of BioSerenity's Home Sleep Testing Program. He also has been a longstanding leader in the field of sleep medicine, including being a former president of the American Sleep Apnea Association. We look forward to hearing uh, Dr. Coppola's perspective, and at the end, there will be time for Q&A. If you have questions or comments, please do feel free to enter them into the chat, and they will be addressed at the end of the talk. Thank you very much, and Dr. Coppola, over to you. Thank you. So hopefully we can all see my screen. Thank you all for attending. Um, it is my pleasure to speak to you today uh, concerning the management of obstructive sleep apnea in primary care. It is uh, clear to me that we now have tools available to allow uh, patients to be managed by their primary caregiver in the setting of the primary care practice. Uh, my goal today is to discuss those tools with the participants um, and discuss the disease, its management, and how this uh, will fit into the continuum of care in a primary care practice. We'll discuss briefly the pathophysiology of obstructive sleep apnea, as well as the demographics We'll talk a little bit about the testing for sleep apnea, the history of polysomnography, which is the in sleep center sleep testing, as well as the evolution of home sleep testing um, over the past 30 years. Um, I discuss the evidence base for the validation of the home sleep testing pathway and discuss the direct to patient model that we are currently employing at BioSerenity. Uh, to close the loop uh, for the patient, we'll also discuss treatment of sleep apnea because uh, a lot of advances uh, have been made in that area over the past several decades, allowing uh, the primary care practitioner to not only diagnose sleep apnea, but also to manage its treatment. I'll then discuss um, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine Society guidelines for obstructive sleep apnea. And finally discuss further care coordination of sleep apnea within the primary care setting. And as Cassandra mentioned, we will have ample time uh, to both answer questions and also to uh, give some more detail on areas in which uh, people like a little more clarity on areas that we've covered. So let's take a look at the human airway. Uh, you see our laser pointer here. Uh, when we're breathing quietly, air passes through the nasal passages primarily, where it's warmed and humidified and then passes posterior to the upper airway, the mouth, uh, the base of the tongue and the soft palate up here and to the area just above the larynx. We see here anteriorly, we have the larynx and posterior to that is the epiglottis. Key in the anatomy is that the posterior wall of the pharynx uh, is bordered by the vertebral column. So it's very much a fixed structure. And here is, of course, the base of the skull. Anteriorly in the airway, we have primarily soft tissue and muscle. And the interesting thing uh, about the human airway 
uh, that area of the anatomy I tried to uh, gloss over during my first year anatomy course because it was way too complicated. Um, the key thing about this airway, it's under continuous uh, neurologic control. And that neuromuscular control affects these muscles, primarily at the base of the tongue, but also in the lateral pharynx and even in the uh, soft palate. When we're, and the reason for this is very simple. I like to say that the trachea, and I am by training a, a pulmonologist, so I love the airway, but the trachea is pretty dumb. It really doesn't do very much. Uh, its major job is to create a tube so that air could pass easily from the pharynx into the lungs. And in fact, um, its, its diameter is maintained by cartilaginous rings uh, to, that are flexible enough so that there's any external trauma, it will bend, but it, uh, the rings will not break. And as many of you know, in trauma, fracture of the trachea is a catastrophic and very rare occurrence. But that can be, that works because the uh, trachea has only one job, is to move air from A to B. The pharynx is very complicated. We have to be able to speak. We have to be able to swallow, spit, sing, uh, et cetera. So based on, and breathe, of course. So based on this, this is under continuous neural regulation. Right now, if I took all the participants and put a needle in, we could see that there is resting or tonal muscle contraction in the muscles of the upper airway during normal, spontaneous, quiet breathing. So this area is maintained by muscles pulling anteriorly from here and here forward. Since this is fixed posteriorly, the airway is maintained primarily by these the vector of these muscles pulling in this direction. And that happens unless we're swallowing or speaking, that is continuous, as I said, tonal contraction throughout the awake state. The interesting thing is the moment we fall asleep or even have a micro sleep, these muscles relax and fall back. In the relaxed position, they approximate almost the posterior wall of the pharynx. And depending on the anatomy, that may or may not be a problem. And this is with sleep onset. The next slide demonstrates this. So in obstructive sleep apnea, soft tissues in the rear of the throat, sorry, collapse and close off the airway. airway. And often this is maybe associated with obesity or anatomic issues, people who are obese may have fatty deposits surrounding the airway in the base of the tongue that further narrow the airway. However, most of this has to do with the skeletal structure of the upper airway. Primarily um, in Caucasians and in um, Eastern Asians, that is Han Chinese, um, this is a small mandible. Um, so um, it, the major risk factor for sleep apnea is probably not obesity, but your mandibular structure. Anyway, during these events, we see this is a patient in the supine position, patient falls asleep, the airway collapses back, but there's still, if I were to lay on my back in the awake state, I still would have enough airway uh, to be able to breathe, but really small. Most of us are breathing in that position with an airway of one or two millimeters. However, when we fall asleep, this relaxes. That tonal contraction of those muscles goes away. This falls back and blocks the throat. Um, our upper airway is a starling resistor, meaning uh, we have airflow here and negative pressure here. Uh, that negative pressure is applied 
not to the trachea, which is rigid, but to the soft tissues. And as the deeper we breathe in, the more this collapses. So the problem with this is we fall asleep, this airway falls back, and then the response is to breathe deeper. Unfortunately, the increased negative pressure makes this worse. And so there's a cycle of partial obstruction, maybe some snoring, breathe a little deeper, the snoring gets a little louder to the point where it's collapsed and we're actually sucking so hard that the airway is completely collapsed. The only response the body has at that point is to die. Uh, and luckily our brainstem doesn't want us to do that and it wakes us up. So there are arousals, usually after a period of time, 10 seconds or longer, uh, there starts to be some hypoxia. The brainstem says, wake up. As soon as our brain, our EEG shows evidence of awakening, that is a increased frequency of the uh, EEG rhythm, um, there's a signal here that we're waking up. Uh, those nerves uh, stimulate these airway muscles to contract and open up the airway, and there's a recovery. So this happens repetitively. Not uncommon, to, every day I see people who stop breathing or diminish their breathing 60 times an hour or more. Um, this creates a lot of problems uh, and stresses, uh, interrupts your sleep and also stresses the cardiovascular system. So, the pathophysiology is basically sleep onset causes relaxation of the upper airway muscles. Uh, during rapid eye movement sleep, usually we have four to five episodes of rap REM sleep a night. During REM sleep, which is dreaming sleep, excuse me, all our muscles are paralyzed except for our diaphragm. So that when the dogs chase us in our dreams, we don't run out of the bed. The problem with that is uh, any use of the neck and shoulder muscles to help insist relieving this obstruction no longer are operative because again, the only thing working at that point is the diaphragm. So typically in garden variety obstructive sleep apnea, uh, the sleep apnea is much worse in two situations, in REM sleep and if you're sleeping supine, that is on your back. Uh, most people with sleep apnea just intuitively sleep in the prone or side position, relieving partially the obstruction. So these repetitive arousals could be 10 times, 20 times, 30 times, 60 times an hour, destroy the normal sleep cycles. And we know it's sleep continuity is important to getting rest and, and feeling normal and functioning neural, uh, neuro physiologic functioning during the day is not only total sleep time, but the amount of uninterrupted sleep. So even if one were able to clock seven hours of sleep with all these arousals, uh, those of you who remember that who still take night call or took night call will know that uh, it doesn't take uh, more than two or three phone calls in the middle of the night to make you feel pretty bad the next day, even if you did clock an adequate amount of total sleep time. Uh, so the uh, symptoms of sleep deprivation are obvious, impaired memory, sleepiness, lethargy, decreased executive function, irritability, depression, uh, are all symptoms of sleep deprivation. But importantly, um, also sympathetic overexpression leads to cardiovascular metabolic consequences and inflammation. Um, and those are as important, if num not more important than the sleep deprivation. When I started at this, you know, when I was back in medical school a long, long, long time ago, this was a sleep problem. I would say now it's a medical problem because this makes almost any disease affecting the adult human worse. So we know that uh, this has been associated with obesity, male gender, why male gender? Uh, testosterone uh, causes a lot of bad things. Uh, men have more muscle mass. So that uh, decreases the size of the airway. 
But in addition, testosterone has a direct effect on the airway muscles that makes them relax more. Uh, females until the time of menopause are <clears throat> protected against this. So if you give a female testosterone, they can develop uh, obstructive sleep apnea purely on the basis of the hormonal effect on the airway. Um, but I want people, everyone knows that men and fat people snore, uh, but I want this audience to understand that if they only think of the garden variety caricature of sleep apnea, they're going to miss a lot of people because 30% of the people are not obese. And also, also importantly, women over the age of 50 have the same incidence as males. So women have less sleep apnea up until menopause and then they catch up. So the most underdiagnosed population with sleep apnea turns out to be females and uh, people who are not obese. Um, and again, uh, I just want to emphasize uh, here again that sleep apnea is not only a sleep disorder, it's a serious complex medical problem that affects everything. Um, the diagnosis of sleep apnea requires a physiologic confirmation, otherwise known as a sleep test, and symptoms supporting the clinical syndrome. And we get a phrase, uh, the disease is actually called obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. The, the, in, in Europe, they, they call it OSAS, um, and that's become kind of the, the acronym for sleep apnea. Here we say OSA, out of habit. I'm gonna, for the rest of this conversation, I'm gonna to refer to OSA. When I do, please understand I'm talking about the syndrome, which means you have the physiology plus the manifestations and symptoms. Well, how much of a problem is this? Uh, uh, the landmark study was published in 1990. The Wisconsin Sleep Cohort uh, said at that time that 4% of women and 9% of men had clinically significant obstructive sleep apnea. They looked at their data again in 2013, and actually that incidence is increasing, probably due to two factors. Number one, our increased recognition, and also the fact that obesity is accelerating at a dramatic rate in our country. Um, I used to say that every major disease category of adults, except cancer, has been associated with OSA. That was 10 years ago. Now we know actually that the incidence of cancer uh, increases in untreated OSA. So all those diseases that we know about, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, are certainly associated with, but so is cancer and almost everything else. And even studies have shown that patients with um, known uh, stage four melanoma, they looked at people in England who had treated OSA and untreated OSA and the melanoma progressed uh, much more rapidly in those people whose OSA was not treated. I would leave with you today that uh, on average, every PCP has at least 200 undiagnosed sleep apnea patients. Um, so um, I remember decades ago having lunch with one of my good friends who was an internist, and he told me that he had a patient with sleep apnea. And I said, Bernie, you have hundreds of people with sleep apnea, you just haven't figured it out yet. Um, and we have data that um, patients complaining of, of symptoms of sleep apnea have to visit their caregiver 2.7 visits with this as a significant complaint before anything is ordered, before a test is ordered. So there is a barrier to care there. I would suggest a part of that barrier to care has been the necessity of having complex evaluation in the sleep center. Um, but um, we'll leave that for the, the next uh, section of this talk. So bottom line is common and it's increasing. 
and 17% of males uh, age 50 to 70, and 9% of women in the same age group is a huge part of everyone's practices. What are, what are the outcomes? What are the burden? Uh, so good studies from the group at University of Washington showed uh, that people uh, with undiagnosed sleep apnea double the health care cost per year of uh, people without sleep apnea. Um, they have double the risk of the Yale group showed that double the risk of stroke and early death uh, by 75 uh, percent in 2005. Uh, the Spanish, uh, because of the national health care system, um, the Marin paper uh, showed um, a marked increase in fatal, non-fatal cardiovascular disease. And it goes on, hypertension, stroke, cardiovascular disease, six times the rate of uh, motor vehicle accidents. And again, multiple studies have shown um, with CPAP treatment, most of these bad um, uh, sequelae can be prevented. I would like to just mention, we can talk about it during the Q&A session, there was a lot, it was a study in New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago, um, which got a lot of press. It was thousands of patients, and it was actually a um, lead article in New England Journal of Medicine that showed that CPAP fa treatment failure failed to produce a positive outcome in any of these diseases. I will tell you that looking at that study carefully, I don't understand why they published it. Yes, it was thousands of patients, which is why they were published. It was done in, in the Pacific Rim. The, the study center was in Australia, but most of these patients were done in Asia and basically third world uh, healthcare delivery systems uh, with providers who had never uh, prescribed CPAP before. And the average CPAP use was uh, three hours. Uh, so these people underutilized the treatment, and then they tried to say the treatment didn't work. And that is not, um, I think, um, it, it, it speaks more to a poorly designed or poorly um, implemented study um, than it does a lack of treatment effect. Good studies have shown that with six hours of nightly treatment, uh, good outcomes in hypertension and cardiovascular uh, endpoints. So. It's a big problem, it's a costly problem. It means a lot to your patients. As I said before, the standard of care has been send them to the sleep center and have them sleep uh, overnight uh, with all this stuff on them. So uh, I love this cartoon uh, because um, it's true. It's patients say, I don't know if I could fall asleep. Um, all of us know that uh, personal experience sleeping in a uh, foreign environment, in a hotel room, in a hospital call room, in a bed that's not comfortable, uh, doesn't do much for your quality of sleep. Um, add 16 channels of, of cords. This gentleman is wired up. He doesn't even have all the monitors on that he's going to be testing with. He is a typical sleep. Usually this is a model or somebody works in the lab. This looks like a typical patient. And the beard is, a, I'll give you all a pearl today. The beard is a typical finding in men with sleep apnea because they usually have small mandibles. I did mention that their skeletal structure does impact the disease. And uh, it's not uncommon to see a beard or a goatee and people with sleep apnea. So this guy looks pretty typical, mid 40s, maybe a little bit older. He's obviously overweight and he has um, facial hair. So he's probably got sleep apnea, whether we test him or not. So the sites of testing, we can go to a hospital and sleep. There are some independent testing facilities where one could have the same, uh, measurements, but do it in a hotel room-like setting um, and still got a stranger watching you, uh, which I think is an impediment to falling asleep. 
And our model, uh, which is a home sleep testing, uh, showing uh, what looks like a model, to be honest with you, uh, with a device and a couple of uh, leads on his uh, face and his finger here. This is what we measure in the sleep center. So if you're like me and you have a certificate that says you're board certified in sleep medicine, you know what all these kugels are mean, mean. And there are occasions where we can get amazing information from those people with frontal lobe epilepsy at night, et cetera, et cetera. But I will posit to you all that this is not necessary to diagnose 80% of the people with sleep apnea. This is a study. This is the first patient ever diagnosed and treated without being in the sleep center. We published this in 1993. Uh, this study was done in 1989, so this is over 30 years. On the left, you'll see, uh, let me just get my pointer here. This is the patient's um, heart rate. And here we have his chest wall. So we can see when he's breathing. And here we see the airflow through a, a nasal thermistor. This is a hypopnea, which means there's a decrease. You see a progressive, each breath is smaller and smaller and smaller. And then there's some recovery breathing. And it's followed by an obstructive apnea, obstructive because he's trying to breathe, but there's clearly no significant airflow. This is his oxygen saturation, which is falling quite low. I mean, I think if this gentleman walked into your office with an O2 sat of 68%, you would be calling 911 or doing something pretty dramatic. Um, but he's doing this, so this, each cycle of this is about 60 seconds. So he had severe sleep apnea. We put him on CPAP, and this is uh, two weeks later on CPAP, and he's completely normal. You see his heart rate is stabilized. This looks like somebody who's asleep, who's breathing his chest wall. He's not struggling to breathe with this, you know, recovery, drown, recovery, drown pattern, nice and even. And this patient is still on therapy in 2021. Never went into a sleep lab. So in 1994, uh, we created a nomenclature to try to describe this. And this is not really that important until you get to uh, payment issues, but just to, to understand some of the nomenclature, type one sleep studies, excuse me, is the uh, routine sleep center polysomnogram, 16 or more channels attended full-time by a sleep tech. Type two is same as type one, except it's usually done in the home and it's unattended. And this has only been done for research purposes. Clinically, I'm not aware of this being used. They do use it in Europe somewhat. Type three is a study I just showed you and what we do uh, at BioSerenity for our program. It's called a part of cardiopulmonary recorder. Must uh, record a minimum of four channels chest wall effort, airflow, heart rate, and oxygen saturation. And that's called a home sleep test. The actual proper term we're trying to emphasize is home sleep apnea test. This does not measure sleep parameters. So calling the sleep test is a little confusing. We prefer home sleep apnea test. That is the official designation because we're measuring sleep apnea. We're not even measuring sleep. Type four is anything that can lead to a diagnosis that measures less than the type three. Type three HSAT is now universally accepted as appropriate diagnostic, not screening, diagnostic for patients at risk for sleep apnea. Okay, so, there are multiple devices out there that have been validated like ours with over 90% correlation with polysomnography. Um, as I said earlier, home sleep apnea testing, we've been using it since 1989. Um, and certainly HMOs on the West Coast have used this extensively. 
uh, group health, which is now part of the Kaiser Permanente system, uh, has been using home sleep testing as their primary modality since 1993. Uh, but it took some time for the sleep community to kind of sign off on this, and, and they are pretty much the standard center. So this was important. This is a landmark study, which is very important. The home pap study was uh, created was a randomized controlled trial, multi-site, uh, primarily in academic medical centers, funded by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine Foundation. And quite honestly, I think they wanted to prove that the sleep center approach was preferable to the home approach. Um, so people were randomized to the usual care, which is a laboratory diagnosis, which required a second study to determine the CPAP pressure. We'll get into treatment in a moment, but as you know, CPAP is the device which applies positive airway to the nasopharynx or, and splints the airway open. Up until 2005, um, it was pretty much you had to figure out what level of pressure to give a given patient. So you bring them into the lab, you say, okay, you know, centimeters of water pressure, at 10 centimeters of water pressure, the patient's airway was splinted, they had no more sleep apnea, and that's what they got a prescription for. And the kind of interesting thing is despite the internight in intranight variability, people who are given a prescription for 10 minute centimeters of CPAP and expected to use that pretty much for the rest of their life. Well, in the sleep lab, often that uh, was done on a second night. So you're talking about two over $1,000 studies, uh, one for the diagnosis and one for the treatment. Occasionally, you can do a split study and do them all in one night. Sometimes uh, some labs do that all the time. Some labs never do it, uh, which is kind of interesting. So that was the standard care arm of this trial. The other half got a home sleep test and they were put on, and we'll get into this a little bit later in my talk, automated CPAP. The automated CPAP briefly does a breath to by breath analysis and adjusts um, the pressure level based on what it's sensing in the patient airway. And I described to my patients the difference between a manual transmission versus an automatic. And this is a little different than the uh, conventional automatic transmission because it's, it's continuous. It's, continu it's like a continuously variable automatic transmission. Anyway, people in this arm got a CPAP trial for a month, and they said, okay, since the other group was on fixed dose CPAP, we'll get the best pressure out of that group for that patient. And if it says 10 centimeters, then we'll put them on 10 centimeters for six months. So people were looked at six months after getting a fixed dose pressure. And the uh, sleep community was a little surprised to find out that their own study showed that the people in the home sleep testing group did as well as the people in the traditional model. Um, and interestingly, two studies done uh, in the VA system, first by Dr. Berry at the University of Florida, Gainesville, uh, showed basically same study design in veterans. They either went into their lab or they went home and had auto CPAP and left them on auto CPAP. At six months, the only difference in the two groups is the people in the home group got their treatment 30 days sooner than people who had to find their way through the other pathway. Dr. Kuna did a multi-center study out of the University of Philadelphia, I mean, University of Pennsylvania system with their affiliated VAs and found the same thing. The people with home test plus autopath did just as well as folks who went into the sleep center, saw a sleep specialist and had all of that. Over time, uh, 
Finally, the uh, American Academy of Sleep Medicine has reevaluated their practice guidelines. This was published in 2019 and said that talking about the treatment of sleep apnea, that the people given treatment should have a physiologic proof that they have sleep apnea as opposed to just treating on symptoms. And that could be either a home sleep test or in lab. So the guidelines now, same from the American College of Physicians across the board uh, and Medicare, that there is no preference for in-lab testing or home. So now that home sleep testing, uh, it's taken a long time from uh, 1989 to 2019, namely 30 years, but we, we finally got in there. Um, let's look at the evolution of treatment. As I told uh, Dr. Sullivan introduced CPAP in 1981. Um, Commercially available automated CPAP has been available since 2005. As I mentioned, it continuously adjusts the pressure from five to 20 throughout the night. Uh, that allows for a lower mean pressure and we think potentially base, better patient adherence and acceptance. And I think that the reason for that is that there's so much change in the airway within the night and night to night that it makes sense to, um, if you put a patient on CPAP at a fixed pressure, inevitably, there are gonna be times where you're over-treating and times where you're under-treating. And finding the optimal uh, pressure on a fixed CPAP required a specialist sleep technologist uh, and a sleep doc like myself to sign off on what was the optimal pressure. What we've learned, like an automatic defibrillator, the technology can do a better job than we can and actually come out with a better outcome because you're never getting more pressure than you need or less pressure than you need. But changes in BMI, body position, stage of sleep, alcohol use, so if somebody has two beers every Friday and Saturday night right before bed, that's gonna be different than the person who walked into a sleep center um, sober with no alcohol on board and had a prescription for a fixed level CPAP that didn't anticipate his Friday and Saturday night bowling dates. Uh, a little bit about uh, our direct to patient model. So how does a patient get a home sleep test? Well, they can go to a sleep center and be handed one. Uh, our program uh, actually is based on um, getting referrals from any licensed provider in any state. We, we service all 50 states in the District of Columbia, ship the device uh, to the patient via UPS. Uh, we're able to track uh, the patient while testing. Uh, our, this device has a Verizon cell chip in it, so it calls us every morning, downloads the data uh, that allows for us to do quality control, um, real time so we can call the patient and said, you know, you had a problem last night, do this and that, um, so that we make sure we get a good test. We have disposable sensors and we have disinfection protocols protecting against all pathogens, including COVID-19. Um, the recorded uh, signals are reviewed and interpreted by a board certified sleep specialist which is required by most payers and licensed in the state of the patient residence. So if you live in Washington state or Florida, we're gonna have a sleep uh, specialist in your state um, or licensed in your state to provide your report. Um, the ordering of faxing can be either via fax or portal. And the great thing about our, our system is because it has a cell phone capability, uh, which the patient doesn't need to do anything special. They don't have to connect their app to Bluetooth or upload Wi-Fi. This is automatic. This thing uh, dials us up on the Verizon network and sends us the data uh, without much uh, or any uh, patient intervention. 
And so it would not be unusual for patients who awoke at 7 a.m. this morning uh, for us to have a signed, uh, reviewed, and interpreted report in the ordering physician's fax machine by close of business the same day or certainly within 24 hours. Um, this is what it looks like. We have, I think you saw a picture with the gentleman um, with this strapped to his wrist. This is a standard oximeter lead. We use, uh, we have a known in oximeter, which is a standard oximeter in here. Uh, this is wraps around the chest and measures chest effort. And this is our proprietary airflow sensor, which measures the sits under the nostril, both nasal and uh, oral airflow. It's more comfortable than a lot of others because it doesn't have a pressure trans transducer in it. Uh, I don't know which um, actually is uncomfortable, it goes in the nostril, this does not. What does it look like? This is what I see. This is a hypopnea with mild sleep apnea. This is a diminished airflow. Um, this is a patient, this is a two minute window. So this is about 10 seconds with several breaths, a decrease in airflow and a drop in oxygen level. But we all love to see the severe ones. So this is, this is not unusual. This is garden variety. I call this third year medical student sleep apnea. These are now five minute windows because these events are so long, they're lasting about 60 seconds. Where we see this whole period, there's no airflow here. This is the airflow channel. He's trying to breathe, so it's not central apnea. He's not got an opioid overdose. He just can't breathe because his airway is blocked. So you have this prolonged apnea followed by recovery breathing and then another event. The oxygen saturations here are routinely dropping down to 70%, which is severe. And this comprises a good part of this, this patient spending a good part of his night underwater. Uh, so this patient averaged out throughout the night, uh, 36 events an hour, which is in the severe category. So where, where are we today? The sleep specialist role, in 2020 was uh, comprehensive care management. The sleep specialist was required to evaluate most, if not all of the patients, provide all of the um, diagnostics, prescribe the treatment and provide all the follow-up care. In 2021, I would say my role is to interpret the sleep studies and they're probably an optimal mix would be 80% in the home, 20% in the lab, and manage 20% of the people who are more complicated. They have comorbid sleep disorders and treatment failures. Who would not benefit from the at-home and, and auto CPAP paradigm? I would say uh, people with central sleep apnea where the diagnostic study showed over 25% of their events were central. People oxygen dependent COPD, uh, certainly anybody with, uh, again, the same level of physical impairment you would see in the class three or four heart failure patients, people with symptoms at rest. Uh, people have bronchitis uh, episodes, two episodes a year, but are functionally normal. I don't think there's any problem. People with behavioral or cognitive issues, severe Parkinson's disease, or the rare patient with significant upper airway and anatomic issues. APAP initia is pretty simple. The default factory center setting is five to center, five to twenty centimeters of pressure. There's something called expiratory relief, which basically lowers the patient lowers the pressure when they exhale. Um, this is usually set at a factory default. If the patient complains of noise, I would recommend turning this off. I do recommend strongly humidification with a heated tube, which requires distilled water and the, the right mask makes a big difference. So as a primary care provider, you, you need to tell the patient, plug it in, turn it on and put water in the container. That's about all they need to do. The masks, I recommend a standard nasal mask, which is pictured here, fits around the nostril. These are nasal pillows, which are very 
popular because they look less obtrusive and they fit in your nose. I don't recommend them as a first stop because uh, it's like walking on high heels. They look pretty, uh, but it's hard to do for eight hours. They tend to leak more, and some people complain of pain in the nostril. I really don't recommend starting with a full face mask, even if the patient says they're a mouth breather that covers the nose and mouth. And studies have shown that they actually they had, a, this was very popular in the 90s. Uh, we found there was actually a higher rate of uh, an initial treatment failure. And it's important, the first two weeks on therapy mean a big deal to these patients. The more successful they are, the better. What are the therapy side effects? Uh, mask interface. So it's usually the wrong mask. Again, pillows and face masks are most problem. Uh, usually it's a poor fit, wrong mask. Over tightening uh, is a big problem. So the tighter people make these, the more they leak. So it becomes, I recommend if they're having mask leaks to put the mask on and loosen the straps all the way and then tighten them till the leak just goes away. Again, the mask leak's a big problem because it disturbs the bed, part, the bed partner more than the patient and makes noise. Nasal congestion was a big problem in the early days of CPAP, and that's due to breathing cold, dry air. The treatment for this is heated humidification, nasal saline, and if necessary, adding nasal steroids in that order. Uh, we rarely see this as a significant problem anymore. It was the number one cause of treatment failure in the early 90s. Aerophasia is common, but usually not people may complain of some belching when they get up in the morning, usually not a problem. Ear pain is very rare. The, the, the good news here is really good coaching support uh, can result in 80% uh, uh, success. Interestingly, a lot of people who don't use CPAP, and I do by the way, think that air pressure or airflow is the major problem with CPAP and makes people CPAP adverse. And the answer is, no, that's not the problem. People don't. Actually, when I'm wearing my CPAP, I have to make it leak sometimes to even tell if it's on. Um, sorry about that. So PAP therapy monitoring, uh, we monitor PAP therapy on a daily basis. And unlike your blood pressure or diabetes prescriptions for pharmacologic therapy, uh, we can actually do that. The home care provider should be able to provide that to your office. Uh, you can get hours of use by day and aggregate pressure levels, the min, max, and average, whether they're having a high mask leak, in their calculated apnea index on treatment. The minimum CMS criteria for use is, and really a psychologist made this number up. It makes no sense, but that's what it is, um, that one would have to use the treatment for four hours, 70% of nights to, to get CMS to continue payment. And that's what the DME will tell you is the minimum treatment. I say, because of the cardiovascular outcomes, I tell my patients, no, I want you to use it six hours a night, 100% a night. That's the treatment goal. Um, so what are the treatment options by disease category? I'm gonna finish up shortly. Uh, normal, if they test normal, uh, conservative treatment, you can do uh, ear, nose, and throat surgery and oral appliance. We have new treatments that uh, uh, actually strengthen the airway muscles, which is close to FDA approval. Uh, MILD has a, a wide range of possibilities. You can prescribe PAP therapy, oral appliances, conservative therapy, airway muscle stimulation. There are now uh, pharmacologic treatments uh, undergoing phase two and three trials. Uh, moderate, uh, basically you're talking about PAP therapy, number one, two, and three, uh, and Inspire, which is uh, a pacemaker gene and glasses stimulation uh, can be considered oral or, or an oral appliance. Again, that's borderline. Uh, and certainly severe sleep apnea, you're really talking about PAP therapy. 
um, and maybe inspire if they fail path. Well, the opportunities for primary care, I'm gonna stop here. Um, this can be done in primary care. Um, there are uh, E&M coding uh, opportunities uh, for this care. It's reimbursed, obviously. These follow-up visits uh, at 30 days, 60 days, and quarterly thereafter, and at a minimum in a successful patient's yearly. Um, patients need, how much do they need? Um, insurance payments uh, will support a mask resupply every three to six months. Um, whether they actually need that or not, you, you'll have to determine. Um, it needs to be cleaned. I think the cleaning routines suggested by the manufacturers are over the top. Uh, um, I recommend cleaning the mask at least uh, twice a week and, and the hose and the reservoir uh, weekly. Um, the device needs re can last for more than five years, but usually insurance will pay for five years. All of this can be done by a nurse practitioner, medical assistants or PA in your practice under your supervision. Uh, the key to success is to partner with a quality uh, DME provider in your community. Um, and uh, I'm gonna stop there and open up the questions. I apologize, we went a little bit over, but we have about 10 minutes left for questions. Thank you, Dr. Coppola. That was very insightful. We really appreciate you uh, sharing your vast experience and, and giving us some great guidance for the primary care practitioners. Uh, as Dr. Coppola suggested, we do have some additional time for questions. If you have questions and you can enter those into the chat, we will certainly address them. So there's a question, uh, do you advise home sleep tests for commercial drivers? Uh, we are doing uh, commercial uh, driver testing um, presently. I, I think the standard of care is you need some proof called chain of custody um, that the patient testing is actually the patient and not his best friend or spouse who does not have sleep apnea. Um, we have a solution for that. The details I don't want to get into, but yes, it can be done. The exception is airline pilots. They have to be done in center by regulation. Thank you, Dr. Capola. We have a, another question as well, and I'll just read it directly. HSAT is diagnostic for people with risk of OSA. Do you need to give a questionnaire or do a short history to qualify risk? And then the second part of the question is, if the result is equivocal, can you repeat the test or do they have to go directly into a PSG in lab test? Those are excellent questions. Yes, uh, I have some sort of history, be it in the form of a questionnaire or your routine history, uh, should be done to evaluate the patient. Um, so um, again, there are, we, you know, there are standard uh, questionnaires. There's certain questions. We have a sleep apnea screening tool. Um, the next thing is, in the next question you asked, I think is a, is a valid one. Um, the, um, and I'm sorry, I just blocked on that. What was that again? It was, um, if the results um, are equivocal, oh, yes, yes. can it be repeated? Yes, so re retesting. The retesting is whether a patient is initially done in center or in the laboratory. The guidelines are that any patient who's symptomatic, particularly if they're sleepy and at some risk for falling asleep, um, at an inopportune time um, should be repeated, whether that was in lab or at home. So the answer is we have the ability to test people for more than one night. So if your clinical suspicion says, I think this patient has sleep apnea and you get a normal test, uh, it means you had a normal test. There may be extenuating circumstances. Uh, so it definitely would repeat it in lab or at home. Thank you, Dr. Coppola. And then there was a follow-up question from one of the participants uh, related to what model of home sleep test do you use and why? We use, uh, we have a proprietary device uh, owned by Bioserenity called the Accusom. 
It's a typical type three recorder. Uh, we use it because, uh, again, it has the um, ability to upload over the Verizon network. It measures a lot of the same channels other devices do, um, but we like it for that reason. Um, there are other approved devices out there. And then a follow-up to the uh, repeat testing. Uh, the question was, if the HST is repeated, is, can you bill for both tests or both days? Yes. Uh, so the way we do it, if we, we like to, uh, depending on the payer, perform more than one night uh, because it's a lot less expensive to do it that way for both the patient and the payer. So we have some contracts where we routinely do two or three nights and the pricing is built in, um, that is less expensive than uh, you know, waiting a month and then shipping another device. Uh, if there's adequate in indications, um, then there is, um, again, it varies pair by pair, but they can't, there's no prohibition. In lifetime, once the patient has a diagnosis of sleep apnea, I'm not aware of anybody uh, refusing to test a patient because they've already had a test. Excellent, thank you. Uh, there's another question from a participant and I'll read this one. Is there a way someone can strengthen the muscles to keep the airway from collapsing so easily? Yes, so um, one way it's been done, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, dirigidu, which is an Aboriginal uh, wind instrument where uh, Aborigines in Australia blow this long tube, and they did studies to show that training on that uh, can build the airway muscles. There's now an FDA device that uses uh, an FDA a device that's under FDA um, submission right now. It's about to be cleared. Um, uh, once that's cleared, that will be available for people who have a negative AHI, who are just snores or mild uh, sleep apnea, and has showed some efficacy in that group. Uh, and it basically is worn during the daytime to, to stimulate the muscles and uh, uh, provide some strength. And I can't really discuss it because it's not yet approved. Stay tuned, within 30 days, I think. I had another question as well. Again, as we think about the primary care providers, what do you think the advantages are of, of a primary care practitioner versus a specialist managing a patient with OSA? Great question. You know, in my prior life, I was a specialist, but I was also part of an organization where half our practitioners were primary care. And I actually helped create a patient-centered medical home and became a big advocate for primary care. We know that long-term follow-up with sleep specialists is poor. And I, I think that the relationship with the primary care provider and the patient is very important to the ongoing success. Let me give you a scenario. So Joe has sleep apnea, diabetes, and hypertension. If he sees me as a sleep specialist and I say, hey, Joe, you're not using your CPAP more than twice a week. That's not acceptable, blah, blah, blah come and see me in a year and I hope you do better. It's gonna have a different effect than I am your physician, your nurse practitioner managing your diabetes and your hypertension. And, you, and I say to you as your PCP, Joe, I can't control your diabetes and your hypertension because you're only using your CPAP twice a week. And I know that because I have the paper right in front of me, as opposed to praying that you get feedback from a sleep specialist, which you all know doesn't happen. So I think that in terms of integrating it into the ongoing care of the patient, it's gonna profoundly affect the benefits to that patient. Excellent. Well, again, Dr. Pola, uh, we certainly thank you for everything that you've shared with us today. Uh, very insightful, very helpful um, for the attendees. Uh, thank you for your participation. Uh, we will make this recording available. Uh, it will be on our website, uh, uh, www.us.bioserenity.com. Uh, so thank you again for all of your attention, and we look forward to uh, chatting with you in our next webinar. Have a good afternoon. Thank you all, and thanks for the great questions.